Lord, we've come here to worship you. Lord, to draw near to you. Lord, that as the, we study the Bible, we desire to hear from you. Lord, we lay our concerns at your feet. We pray you create a rest among us, that we would rest in you as we depend upon you for all of our life. Lord, we trust you for eternity, and we trust you for our life. And Lord, we thank you for gathering us together. Lord, we pray for those that are going through difficult times, whether it's financial or relational, or maybe help. Lord, maybe emotional. And Lord, we just draw near to you and we cast all of our cares at your feet because you care for us. Lord, speak to us and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you know, coming up, I hope you know, coming up in uh, March, the very last week of March, we are gonna be involved in gathering ourselves together as we talked about getting yourself to a place where God is blessing We're going to create an environment where God is going to be speaking to us through the Bible, through teaching, and life action ministry is going to be coming. They're going to be bringing youth teams. They're going to be bringing children teams. They're going to be talking to the adults starting on Sunday morning, March 27th. But we need your help. We need, in order, you, we all gather together. We all work together to create this environment. And there's a couple things that we do. Um, First of all, we've been praying like we did that all church prayer gathering. We're going to be praying for that. We're going to be having another one. Uh, but also, we need help. When the team comes, there's going to be like 20 college students, and we need them to stay in your house. And you say, oh, no. And I'm saying, oh, yes, that is fantastic. We have, I figured up, I think we have over um, like, uh, I think it was like 900 million, maybe over a billion dollars worth of property. The church does. And it's your houses. <laughs> it's your houses. <laughs> and so uh, if you are, I, I tell you what, you watch this uh, little video And we'll play this video of Life Action Ministry and you see what God does to our hearts. It only took us maybe 30 minutes with those three young men to realize Mm -hmm. what God was doing. So let's be clear, we put our name on the list thinking Worst case scenario, we're making a casserole. You know, uh, we had no idea that we would have three young men uh, join our family. You know, they came right in this house and all three of them sat down on the couch when we brought them home that night and um, we just started talking to them. It was like God picked them out for our family and put them right in our home to be 24 hour ministers to us over the Life Action Summit. I mean, it was amazing. And they didn't come and hide in their rooms. No. I mean, they spent hours playing with the boys, <laughs> whether it's card games or board games or going through Bible stuff. And that had a tremendous impact on both of the boys. They absolutely were zero disruption in our schedule. Zero. They were the most respectful, the most polite individuals, and if anything, they helped with things around the house that they absolutely did not have to help with. We didn't clean up after anybody. We didn't have to do any of that. They were wonderful. They just weren't in and out. I mean, God used that time. God knew what He was doing, bringing those three into this house. and. It's a faith thing. Trust God, you know, yes, do it. They need places to stay. They need to step up and do it, and God will take care of the rest. Amen. If you'd like to know more information uh, about this, Shannon Sawyer is in the back. She's going to be at the connection counter. You can get information and pick her brain, and I promise you, she'll end up being your best friend. She does that to everybody. You have a good time. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. We're in chapter 29 in Genesis, continuing in our story. Um, Pew Polling Organization um, did a poll on the number one hymn in America. Do you know what the number one hymn in America is? Amazing Grace. No shock to you. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace was written by a man who... Uh, penned what had happened in his heart and what had happened in his life is written by John Newton. John Newton was born in a Christian home. John Newton's mother taught him verses until he was seven years old and she died. 
He was raised by relatives, and at 11 years old, he went to work for his dad on a ship. And he acquired his morals and his mindset, his worldview from sailors. And when he became a young man, he bragged that he could cuss and drink better than any other sailor because that's what sailors do. And if you're in our Navy, I apologize for saying that, but you know that it's true. He just is a, a rough guy. He was, a, he was an individual that desired sin more than he desired anything else because, as you know, sin is pleasurable for a season, but then it begins to take a toll. He tried to escape from the Royal Navy. He was caught. He was flogged. He was put in prison. He escaped. He became a prisoner on a slave ship, and he worked for a taskmaster that would beat him, and he would live down in the galleys, and he would capture slaves and put them on a ship till finally, as uh, circumstances came about, he ended up running his own slave ship, one of the most disgusting occupations you could ever be a part of. One day he had an experience of where he almost drowned and when you see the end of your life coming you begin to rethink things and he began to rethink things. He began to read different books. He read Kemp's Imagination of Christ. He also was under the influence of the Wesley brothers and the Whitfields and he came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And his life radically changed. He actually joined forces with Wilberforce to get rid of slavery in the UK area. And he was an unbelievable man. And then he wrote this hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a, what, wretch like me. Now, a lot of people don't like that word wretch, right? I mean, when was the last time you called yourself a wretch? Well, it's when, the, probably the last time you sang Amazing Grace. You know, we are wretch. We are completely, totally sinful. Now, you're not outwardly as bad as you could be. In fact, you're probably not as outward, just like me, not as bad as the things I think about doing, right? Because there's this part of us that who we should be, and we know who we should be, and who we really are on the inside, there's a disconnect to some degree, right? Who we really are on the inside and who we want other people to think we are, there's really a disconnect. By the way, if you don't notice that disconnect, that you don't realize that there's a difference between the way you think on the inside and the way you are on the inside is different than the way you should be, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You and I must know that we are sinful because if you and I don't know the proper diagnosis, we can never receive the proper cure, which is salvation, right? Right? So when you talk about a wretch, this Jacob dude in chapter 29 of Genesis, he was a wretch, an incredible wretch. And this passage of scripture obviously is preceded by chapter 28, where we see him in chapter 10, I'm sorry, verse 10 of chapter 28, to where he's on his way, he's following the instructions of his parents to go get a wife back in the home country. That's exactly what his dad Isaac did. And he's to go back to the home country because he didn't want him marrying anyone from the pagan country. But he wanted to go back and find a monotheistic individual. And you know he reached a certain place. And at this certain place, the sun set. He grabbed a rock, put it by where his head was. And he went to sleep. And there was this dream starting in verse 12 of Genesis 28. And this dream was an unbelievable revelation. Not that the dream wasn't real, but the dream was real. You could actually say it was a dream slash vision to where God pulls back the flesh and allows someone to see what's happening in the eternal realm that is a reality that, that once you see that, then everything begins to change in the physical realm. And that's what he says. He sees this dream, and his dream is God is at the top, and angels, God's messengers are going up and down the ladder as if to say God is wanting to change things on earth. God is wanting his kingdom to come on earth just as it is in heaven, right? That's what Jesus prayed. So Jacob gets a load of that. He sees it. He wakes up and he makes this statement. First of all, he says, this happened here and I didn't even know it. And last week we talked about missing what God is doing, right? 
And so God was at work in a powerful way, and he said, I didn't even know it, and it was happening the whole time, and God was pursuing, and God is able, and God is doing, and I didn't even know it. Now, think about this. Jacob was raised, his grandfather Abraham, his dad Isaac. Remember what we learned about Isaac? Isaac went up on that hill, Mount Moriah, and God provided the lamb, and he didn't have to die. Remember that? God did amazing things. His own birth was a miracle. And so basically, he had heard about what God was doing, but he never really experienced it himself. It wasn't a personal relationship until this place. In fact, after he he met God in this vision, and he began to see what reality was all about, he said, this place is now called the house of God. Now, just a point. That place never, there was no churches in those days. There was no temples in those days. There was no tabernacle, if you know. And so the the people just worship God in spirit, so to say. And even after this point, they never made a tabernacle there. They never made a church there. If you go there, it's just kind of like a desert right now. And so it's not so much the location. It's just what the event of meeting God. And he called it the house of the Lord. We just sang a song about dwelling in the presence of the Lord. And it's, it's great when the church comes together. And I think the Lord's presence is here in a different way, a unique way. But really, the Lord is everywhere, and we worship Him everywhere, wherever we go. And so he developed this relationship, and he actually was transformed. And how do we know that? Well, look what happens. Surely God is in this place, and I didn't even know it. And then he began to make vows, and he began to take these rocks, and he made it into a monument, not to worship, but to tell all the other generations what God is really like. And then he said, I'm going to give God every, you know, a tenth of everything I have, and I'm going to serve him and serve him only. And so here's what happened. He was transformed at that moment. This guy who was known as a wretched thief, he was a con man. Remember, he conned uh, his dad to give him the inheritance and the blessing of the firstborn. He was the secondborn, only by a nanosecond, but he was the secondborn. He didn't deserve the birthright, but he stole the birthright from his brother Esau. How did he do that? He deceived his dad. His dad, they assumed, was on his deathbed, and his mom says, hey, listen, dad's eyesight's not so good, and he's probably going to die. Why don't you go in there like your brother Esau? And he's like, that ain't going to work. My brother's hairy and red, and I'm not that. I'm, I'm not. I'm a mama's boy. He's a daddy's boy. And besides, he smells like dirt. And you're like, how do you know that? Well, it says it. Isaac said, Esau, my son, you smell like a well-plowed field. You smell like dirt. You think that smells bad, but actually, have you ever gone into an arena like, like at the rodeo? In fact, Del Brisby asked John Mark, can you make me a candle that smells like arena dirt? And all the men are going, yeah, I'll take some cologne that smells like an arena dirt. So he smelled like dirt. And then he deceived. So he goes in. His mother says, go play like you're Esau. Put goat hair on your arm. Put sheepskin around your neck. And go in and tell him you're Esau. And he does it. He deceives Isaac. And Isaac blesses him. And he steals the wealth and the privilege and the authority that actually belonged to his brother. If Esau, I mean, if, if Jacob was alive today... He would be calling you this afternoon and saying, you need a warranty for your car. And he'd be doing those kinds of things. He'd be trying to get your money somehow, some way, because he was just a wretch. He was that kind of guy. But when he came to know the Lord, everything changed. And you know that happens, right? You know that happens, right? When you come to know the Lord, things change. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 says, we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. The Bible tells us that the old is gone, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We are new creatures in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. There is transformation when you literally partake of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the uh, hardest parts of what I do uh, is, is when I see people reject biblical counseling. And, you know, they'll, they'll, I'll hear of a problem and I'll meet with them and, and I'll lay out, look, this is what the Bible says. And they said, well, we thought you would say something like that, but we were just kind of looking for something else. I was just wanting you to tell him, wait, wait, it doesn't work like that. And, and so I really have the easiest job. I don't have to make up stuff. I just say what God's already said. He just already, this is what you do. And then, but here's where the, here's where the exciting part comes in is people go, oh, 
That's how you do it. This is what God wants in my life. And that's incredibly exciting. I said, yes, that's what he does. And we're all struggling to get there, but this is the direction. This is the road. And the Spirit of God helps moving you that way. You just got to be willing. But the discouraging part is when people look at it and they go, "Mm, no thanks. And I'm like, ugh, it's going to get worse for you now. It's just not good. And so he met with God. And God transformed him because he began to partake. And we know that he partook because he became obedient to the very simple things that God was asking. But then we look in chapter 29, and this gets really weird. Chapter 29, Jacob resumed his journey. He went, you know, finished the 500-mile journey. And he's going back to Tehran, Haran, and he went to the eastern country, and he looked and he saw a well in the field. Three flocks of sheep, this is verse 1 of chapter 29, Genesis Three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it because the sheep were watered from this well. A large stone, keep that in mind, a large stone covered the opening of the well. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone, shepherds, plural, would roll the stone away from the opening and water the sheep. And the stone was then placed back on the well's opening. Verse 4, Jacob asked the men at the well, hey, my brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they answered. And that's where he was going. Do you know Laban, son of Nahor? Jacob asked them. And they answered, we know him. Is he well, Jacob said? Yes, they said. And here is his daughter, Rachel, coming with the sheep. And then Jacob said, look, it's still broad daylight. It's not time for the animals to be gathered. Water the flocks and then go out and let them graze. In other words, he was there looking for a wife. And then Laban's daughter, who he was trying to find family members... He figured out he is her cousin. And you're going, yuck. No, listen, it doesn't work like that. Back then, it was like, man, she's pretty. And we would think, she's pretty, but she's your cousin. They thought, she's pretty and she's my cousin. (laughs) I mean, it was really weird. But he saw her coming with the sheep. And you can imagine coming on the field and the beautiful sheep. And as the light was glistening in her hair, he fell in love. And then when she's coming, he starts playing El Patron and Big Boss. And he starts telling everybody what to do. All right, guys, you're supposed to be watering your sheep in the morning. Why are they all here today? They're saying, listen, we don't do it until all the sheep come together because there's only one well and we want to be friends with one another. So we do this, but you get this heavy stone. So right when she's coming, he by himself goes and he moves the stone. How did he do that? Man, love does crazy things to you. No, that's not it. Um, Maybe God just empowered him. And he takes the stone that he usually takes many shepherd and he moves it away. And I'm sure he's kind of, you know, flexing and all this stuff, whatever they do. I don't know what to do, but they did it. And, and he sees her. And then the romance is about to start. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came uh, with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. So she smelled like Esau. Interesting, huh? She smelled like Esau. She was a shepherdess. She hung out with the sheep. As soon as Jacob saw his uncle Laban's daughter, Rachel, with the sheep, he went up and he rolled the stone away from the opening and watered his uncle Laban's sheep. In other words, he just took charge. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept loudly. So kissing a cousin is not that big a deal. I mean, you'll see this in a minute, that there's just a kissing going on in the family. That's how they did. But kissing and then weeping, she's got to know something's going on. This is weird. And so he starts weeping. And then he told Rachel that he was her father's relative, Rebecca's son, and she ran and she told her father, verse 13. Then Laban heard the news about his sister's sons, Jacob, and he ran out to meet him, hugged him, and then kissed him. See, that's what they do. They get together, they kiss because they're cousins. They're kissing cousins. That's what it is. And, and everything is really good. Laban said to him, yes. Uh, oh, wait, first, Jacob told him the last sentence of verse 13. Jacob told him everything that had happened. Now, did he tell him everything? He could have. I mean, did you tell him about the way you lied to your dad? Did you tell him the way that you tricked Esau? Or did you just tell him, Mama told you to come get a wife? But look at what he says. And then Laban says, yes, you are my own flesh and blood. And so I tend to think, I tend to think, maybe he told him everything. Now, you would think he would want to tell him everything. Because he would want him to know that I've got my daddy's blessings, Abraham's grandson's blessings, as though I'm the first child. I mean, that would be attractive to the father of the bride, right? 
And so, and he says, yes, you are my own flesh and blood, as though he's saying, we're cut out of the same fabric. And I wonder if Jacob knew that they really were cut out of the same wretched fabric of humanity. After Jacob had stayed with him about a month, Laban said to him, this is verse 15, just because you're my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me your wages. Verse 16, now Laban had two daughters. The older was Leah, the younger was named Rachel. Leah had delicate eyes. That's a nice way to say something that's not nice. Leah had delicate eyes, but Rachel was shapely and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said to Laban, I'll work for you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban replied, better that I give her to you than to some other man. In other words, he, he's playing negotiator. When you're, when you're uh, trading horses and trading, you just say, you make it sound like, okay, I might as well give it to you as some other guy. And it wasn't like, yes, I found the son-in-law. He just kind of brushed it off. You can tell a little bit of deception that is going on, but it gets worse. I'll work for seven years. Um, so Jacob worked, look at verse 20. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel. And they seem, that's the years, they seem like only a few days to him because he, his love, because of his love for her. He worked seven years to get the right to, re, to marry Rachel and it only seemed like a few days. And all the women said, aw. Just a little side note. Uh, guys, women love it when you sacrifice. And you say, man, I've been sacrificing a long time. <laughs> no, listen, there is something special about when you give of yourself and your time and your hobbies and your moments and you just lay them down. It's, it's like when you take kids for a day or the grandkids for a day or, or you just do things that very seldom are asked for but noticed. And it goes a long, long way. Why? Because at that point, love is the motivator and not anything else. Just because of love. And love and sacrifice are synonymous. Love and sacrifice are synonymous. I mean, we think love is just being Twitter-pated, right? We think love is just this chemistry thing of that it's deaf, dumb, and blind, can't smell, and all this stuff. And we, they write songs about it. But actually, love is an action. It's a giving up of self. You learn that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrong. Love believes the best about the others. Love endures all things, believes all things. Love never fails. We also learn this out of the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And that was says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself for her. And so this is what he's doing. He is giving himself for her by spending seven years. But here comes the switch. Watch this. I'll work for you seven years. Verse 21, then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife for time is complete. I want, to I want to consummate the marriage, he says. So Laban invited all the men of the place to feast. That evening, Laban took his daughter Leah, not Rachel, but Leah, and gave her to Jacob. And he slept with her, and Laban gave his slave Zilpah to his daughter Leah as, as her slave. And you'll, you'll, that'll pick up the story later in chapter 30. And then when morning came, there was Leah. So he said to Laban, what is this you have done? You know, he thought he was getting Rachel, and at night, they don't have a lot of light. He didn't know. They had too much to eat and drink. He spends the night with Leah. He wakes up in the morning, and it's Leah and not Rachel. And you can imagine what he's thinking the whole time. It's not her fault at all. So he goes to Laban, what have you done? What is this you have done for me? Wasn't it Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? And Laban answered, is it not the custom in this place to give the younger daughter in marriage before the first? Complete this week of wedding celebration and we will also give you the younger one in return for the work yet for another seven years. What a crook. But actually, the way the words flow, the younger and the older, and that the older is the one who has the prominent position and while these words were coming out of his mouth, 
It was an indictment of what he just did to Esau. The younger is the one that got the older spot. Don't you know this? When you're in social studies, Jacob, in junior high, and you were taught the way things go of the older brother and the younger brother, that was just a local custom. By the way, God didn't instill that custom. That was just their custom, but God was honoring the blessing. God in no way, no way uh, endorses this polygamy, this sister-wife crazy stuff. He did not endorse that. In fact, you know what he endorsed? After he created Adam and Eve and and he just created Eve, and he brought Eve to Adam, and Adam looks at her, and he says, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And then the Bible says, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and will cleave only to her, right? Only to her. So there is a leaving of all others, all the flames are out, and you are to cleave, leave, and then cleave only to one. That was the command, and that was the direction. And so they blew it. And so uh, now what's interesting is that it's still in the Bible. And you go, you know what? I'm actually glad it's in the Bible. It's, it's a little embarrassing to talk about here in church. I mean, gosh, it's just kind of embarrassing to talk about these things. But I'm kind of glad it's there. Why? Because these are people in the Bible that are just like you and me, people who sin, people who fall. You look at all the other religious books that have been written, and they, they don't include anything negative about any leader whatsoever. But the Bible does. You know why? Because it happened. And the Bible is the, most, is the most truthful book and is the center of all truth and is the measurement of all truth, and therefore we see that it happened. And it's just to say that we, we are all the same. So let me bring a couple of applications. He eventually, he did marry Leah, and eventually, the next at the end of the week, he married Rachel, and he finished his work. And then we see in chapter 30, we see how the 12 tribes of Israel came together. And it's a very interesting story. But I want you to look at a couple of lessons. Number one, listen to this. Even though Jacob met God face to face and his life was changed, his lessons were not over. Okay? You can learn a lot by having experiences with God. You can learn a lot when you're in church. You can learn a lot at conferences. You can learn a lot in Bible college. You can learn a whole lot. But yet life isn't just learnt in the church house or in your devotions. And truth isn't just learnt there. But it's also learnt in the school or in life itself of hard knocks. It's like there are some things you have to live through and experience to actually learn. It's the difference between cold teaching and hot teaching, if you will, Cold teaching, just being information, and information and truth is so important, but until you put it out in practice, it's not real to you. And so there's a lot that God wants to teach me and wants to teach you as we live life and know this, that the, the, the teacher is the Lord God Almighty. The schoolhouse is hard times. It's hard times. Now, we don't like hard times. We hate trials and tribulations, and we know we all go through them, but usually we're trying to avoid them, and we're asking God to completely deliver us from them. I have a chance to speak with, with pastors who are under persecution in other countries just because of technology. We're able to, to talk a lot. And um, on Mondays, I talk with one on Mondays, and I, and I say, so how, how's it going in, for the church under great persecution? And they began to tell me things. And so one thing that I noticed that happened, uh, very, I noticed very quickly, is that when he's asking for prayer, they very seldom ask to be taken out of the situation. Listen to this. They always pray to be, that God would allow them to be faithful in the situation. Do you see the difference? American Christianity is, is a very small small group of all of Christendom throughout the ages. And one of the characteristics that's, that we notice about American Christianity is we're always asking God to make us very happy and God, you need to take this away from me and God, I, I really want you, uh, I've got, a, I've got a, a friend that might be dying and I don't want them to go to heaven yet. So it's as if we're trying to pray people out of heaven instead of trying to pray people out of hell. You know what I'm saying? 
And so it seems like the, the, now there's nothing wrong with praying for healing. There's nothing wrong for praying for deliverance. But we tend to neglect that God would make us faithful even in the trial because it's right in the trial that while you're being faithful is when God begins to teach you and to mold you and to shape you in the midst of this. Because he, he's a master at changing lives. Not just the born-again experience, not just learning these things in your Sunday school or in your devotions, but it's learning it while you begin to live your life. It's like the limb that was just hanging out one day. Because that's what limbs do. Storm come and lightning strikes and the limb falls to the ground. And the limb is like, ah! And then summer comes and it's hot and then winter comes and it's cold and then the fall comes, he's covered up in leaves and dogs, wolves take him and run off with him and one day he finds himself underneath some leaves and dark and dank and stinks. And, but he hears a little twitter patter of rabbits and deer and they're running off and then he hears the footsteps of the master archer. And he hears it and he's thinking, oh no, maybe, maybe, maybe today's my day. And he's down there under the leaves going, hey, over here. <laughs> And all of a sudden, the footsteps get closer and closer, and he picks up the lamb. And the lamb is like, oh, this is my day. I'm picked up by the master archer, and he's thrown in the wagon, and he's just all happy, and he's talking to the other limbs. How about you? What have you been doing? I've just been laying around doing nothing. The next thing I know, I get picked up. Yay, today's our day. And then they get come to the house and the cottage, and then they're thrown into a shed, and they shut the door, and they're there for months and months and months. And the lamb was going, man, I had higher expectations than this. So just living in somebody's shed, and all of a sudden he hears the creak of the door, and the light gets bright, and all of a sudden the master, sergeant, the master archer comes and grabs our little limb, and he takes him, and the limb is so excited, until next thing you know, the master archer comes, and he begins to rip the bark off his back. He's going, oh, that hurts. I didn't expect that today. And he begins to rip it all off, and then he takes this rasp, and he runs it down the side of it, just, and then the limb is just going, ah, oh, and then, whoosh, ah, didn't expect that. And finally, the master archer stops. He's going, oh, thank you, thank you. It does feel a little better, though. It's a little freer and can breathe a little better. And the next thing you know, he's feeling dry, and the master archer throws him in a barrel of water, and he just goes down in the water, and he says, you know, and he said, well, I'm right down here. And so he says, down there, and, and he's blowing bubbles, and he stays there for three weeks. And when he got to the point where he just couldn't handle it anymore, he feels the movement of the water, and a hand comes down and grabs him, and he says, finally, I'm free. I'm no longer underwater, and he throws him into a smokehouse. He said, ah, oh, this is much better. Until two weeks goes by, and he's like, I'm so dry. I'm going to die. It's horrible. And then, of course, three weeks later after that, the master archer comes and grabs him and takes a little sandpaper and just starts and our little limb goes oh, that feels kind of good and he works him bends him takes a little knife and scores the back and puts some feathers on him and takes a piece of brass and fashions a tip and puts it on the other end and he's like now I'm not a limb but now I'm an arrow and the master archer puts him in the quiver and he takes him out to the woods and he pulls him out of the quiver. He selects him and he draws him back on the bow and he lets it fly. And the arrow goes and he goes off to the right, hits the target, but misses the bullseye. So the master archer pulls him out, winds him back, shoots him two more times and realizes he has a bias to the right. And so he takes him, pulls the tip off, pulls the feathers out, puts him back in the water, puts him back in the smokehouse, finds him down again, whittles a little bit, works him, till finally he shellacks him. And he puts the feathers on, he puts the point to his life on, and he shoots him, and he hits the bullseye. And let me tell you, God is the master of putting a point on your life. But a lot of pain comes, a lot of trials. And so what you and I are about are people who simply abide, obey the Lord God Almighty 
What Jacob did back in chapter 29 is it says that he saw the Lord and he was afraid and he said it was awesome at the same time. That there was a terror of God of how holy and awesome he is, but there's also simultaneously a rejoicing in his presence. And then he commands you and me to be obedient in the very simple things and blessings begin to come. So here's what Jacob learned. He learned that his lesson isn't over. Just because you meet the Lord and you get saved, you still have much to do. You have much growing. You have much discovery of your own flesh, of your own self, as though the Lord is opening you up, like peeling the layers off of an onion to get to the heart of the matter. And you and I stay in the school of sanctification. The Apostle Paul did that. The Apostle Paul was a terrorist. He turned many women into widows who were a part of the church of God. He would kill, he would terrorize the church until one day he was going to Damascus and he saw the bright light. And Acts chapter 26, when he's in front of King Agrippa, he tells exactly what happened. And this bright light overwhelmed him and he said, Who are you, Lord? And the voice came back, says, I am Jesus Christ, whom you persecute. And then his whole life was changed. He told King Adippa, Agrippa, I met Jesus. Everything changed. But you know what happened? The Lord put Paul for three years in what's called a time of trial, the seminary of silence in Arabia. And that's when God really began to teach him. In fact, he referred back to those times when he was there in the desert. It happens all the time. So he learned this. He learned that Beginning to grow in the Lord is a step-by-step process. He also learned this, what you sow you will reap. That's in the book of Galatians chapter 6, but it's 60 times or 60 different verses throughout all the Bible that says it in one way or another that what you sow you will reap. And that's exactly what he experienced here. I mean, it is, it is very poetic the way Genesis is laid out. You deceived your brother? you got deceived. Now, don't believe this. Don't believe for a moment that just because some bad things are happening in your life, it's your fault by something you did wrong in the past. We don't know anything about that. All I know is that when I sow bad things, bad things tend to happen. If I cheat, steal, lie, envy, lust, bad things will really come about that out of my heart. But I also know this. When I begin to become obedient, I know that God blesses those that are obedient. Christians, listen. God blesses your obedience. He blesses when we meet with Him in the morning. He blesses when we desire Him above all. He blesses when we come together to encourage one another in the body of Christ. He blesses when we give. You can't, how many of you know, you cannot outgive God? And so when you sow in righteousness, righteous things happen. So here's what I'm saying is listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is is so often underrated. You're not saved by good works. You're not saved by obedience, but you are sanctified. You grow as you and I choose to be obedient. But we also, he learned his second lesson, as you see in chapter 30. We won't be going over that next week, but in chapter 30, you see this, that he learns that he's not in control of anything. He's not. He can't make Leah happy and he can't get Rachel pregnant. I mean, the story is he has all these sheep, and he is creating these sheep by the way he's breeding them to have certain kinds of spots, but yet he can't have kids when he wants to have kids. And God is saying, listen, I'm in charge of more than you ever could imagine. And he begins to submit himself to the sovereign hand of God, and it plays out well for him later in life when you learn these things. So here's what we know. From this, if you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, man, God is still working on you to change you, to turn you and me into better people, into people who hear his voice more clearly, who have a sharper point to our life without any kind of bias. We also know that there are consequences into the things that we do. What you sow, you shall reap. And third, Man, God's in control of a lot of things. In fact, he's in control of everything. And I must bend my knee, my heart, and my soul to him. 
If you've never given Jesus control of your life, let's do it now. Let's do it right now. And it's not by getting baptized. It's not by giving money. It's not even by coming forward at a church. It's by you surrendering in your heart to the magnificent, glorious beauty, wisdom, judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you give him your life. You give him your future. You confess him as your Lord and your Savior. Jesus, you died on the cross for me. You have saved me from all of my wretchedness so that I can be your child and thank you for that. That's what you do. A lot of times you can express it in a prayer. You say, Jesus, forgive me my sins. You are Lord and Master and I surrender to you. Would you do that today? Man, he loves you and he cares for you and he wants to walk with you. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and thank you. Lord, that you draw people to yourself. Lord, that you don't leave us alone. You give us the ability to reach out to you. Lord, you give us even the desire to do so. And Lord, we love you for it. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I invite you, the Lord, on behalf of the Lord, I invite you to come to him. The Bible says that you and I are to make an appeal to one another, inviting people to come to Christ. You can do it today. He wants you to know today's the day. Today is the day of salvation. He accepts anybody with any past as long as you acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. Christian, are you in a tough trial? And I know many of you are. Listen. Draw near to the Lord. We pray for great grace. We pray for great deliverance. But we also pray for faithfulness under pressure. And Lord, we just pray that you would take us and use us for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.